Minister MacDonald. I'm delighted to be here to spare the blushes of the IIEA having another all-male panel. Um, <laughs> we were due uh, to have uh, Lynn Boylan, unfortunately she isn't available this morning, but um, I want to reassure all the men here and I just hope that my oestrogen is enough for you. Um, the net impact of Brexit is going to be um, impossible to judge. I feel a little bit guilty. I've been on a bit of a it's been a bit of a cottage tour. Our industry has kind of grown up around Brexit and I've been guilty of um, taking part in that. I suppose I come to Brexit with all of the emotional and cultural and psychological hang-ups of somebody who grew up on the border in the um, shadows of the largest uh, British army base probably in the north um, during the Troubles and, um, and the frustration sometimes that when you are a reporter or anybody from the north in the south that uh, generally, and, it's, and all of the, the previous panel, all of the editors seem to reassure us or, or confirm something that, that sometimes there isn't an awful lot of interest in the north until it's staring in the face and it's been quite funny in some respects watching our colleagues in the UK Google who are the DUP and why does it matter? But in the last hour we've seen why it does matter. They've just negotiated a deal of one billion, possibly up to 1.5 billion sterling um, for the North. Um, so I suppose I do come uh, to the Brexit debate with a particular um, uh, focus on the border. But what we've invited each of the panel to do this morning, um, to Matt Carthy, Stephen Donnelly, Michael McDowell and Neil Richmond, is to close their eyes and imagine what life might be like in 2025. I think if we've learned anything from the last two years is that it really is impossible to predict anything. But I wonder in 2025 will we be still in negotiations a la Canada with a couple of Wallonias in the way, perhaps not too happy? Um, will the UK have thrown in the towel on the back of negotiation fatigue or perhaps the full impacts or real impacts of it at that time? Um, are we in a United Ireland or will we have had a border poll um, by that stage? Brexit certainly has accelerated a debate that two or three years ago would have not been um, a mainstream debate. Um, are we in a federal Europe or, um, or on that path? Will the Macron magic uh, have continued? Um, and, you know, will it be all about Brexit anyway? Will other issues have come to the fore and taken over? I find sometimes, naturally, that because we are here at the epicentre of the Brexit debate, it's, it's something that we, are, we speak a lot about and discuss an awful lot about. But the further away you go, especially on the continent of Europe, where I was speaking recently about Brexit, and even further afield, Dan and I were recently in Australia at an EU-Australia leadership forum, and uh, the feelings about Brexit are, are different depending on your perspective and what region you are in. So I wonder, will there be other issues? What will the China story be at that stage? What will the US story be at that stage? And where will the migration, uh, migration crisis um, have evolved at that point? But what we've asked each of the panels to do is to outline um, what outcomes they expect, what they'd like to see, and what positions the key players should be adopting at this point. Um, they won't have seven minutes each, they'll have five minutes each. That's the difference between a female and a male editor. And I'll be uh, <laughs> keeping strictly to that. But. Um, because he's got a big, impressive book that he brought in with him, uh, Michael McDowell, I'll open the floor to you first. <laughs> okay, I, I was just wondering, they were talking about, you know, how do you describe a group of editors? I'm just looking around this room now, they're called leavers. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the first thing is uh, to envisage uh, Ireland post-Brexit. And uh, clearly, um, as long as we are in a state of ignorance as to how hard or soft the border will be, and that in turn, uh, depends completely on how close the um, trading relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union is. Uh, we, are, we are speaking about an, an unknown and an unknowable at this stage. But um, myself and Neil Richmond have been uh, serving on a committee chaired by Neil, which is about to publish a report in the very near future, on the, our view at this stage, given our imperfect knowledge, of the implications for Ireland of the Brexit process. And uh, it, it, um, without divulging any secrets, it will be a good report and a comprehensive report. And it has been solution orientated from the very beginning. So Neil may be, want to say something further about that later. Um, I believe the common travel area poses no problems whatsoever. I don't believe that there is any significant problem and the people who see complications arising from it um, are, are, are manufacturing doubts. <coughs> The fact that a French person living in Sutton may have different rights when going to the United Kingdom from an Irish person is a matter of uh, complete indifference to uh, the, um, the courts in Great Britain and uh, the, their status in Great Britain will be regulated by whatever deal is done. But the difference between how they are treated and how Irish people are treated is irrelevant. So I believe that there will be 
common uh, um, national or citizenship uh, open to people in Northern Ireland as is uh, at the present. Irish people would be able to travel to England and British people to Ireland entirely freely. They would be able to vote in each other's parliamentary elections and they would be able to freely establish business in, in, in both countries after this. That, I think, will remain. So I, I don't think that's an issue. The, um, the second major issue is freedom of movement of goods on the customs union side. And the freedom of movement of goods is obviously dependent on how close, uh, or how, how approximate to free trade the British and the European Union negotiate their deal. And um, I don't know whether total free freedom of movement of goods is, is likely. I doubt it somehow. But I mean, I do believe that um, the elaboration of a customs control on the border depends very much on the size of the problem and the nature of the problem. One of the things that is uh, um, very obvious to me, though, however, is that in Ireland in particular, and in both parts of Ireland, um, the agriculture and agribusiness sector uh, have very um, similar um, interests at the moment, and the Tories are going to, um, they have guaranteed that the, the present situation will, will endure up to 2020, but uh, my, Michael Gove is talking about cheap food policies thereafter, and that is, is, is um, absolutely pregnant with, with consequence for Ireland if, if, if you're looking at what's going to happen after that. The, um, and northern farmers in particular, and their subsidisation, uh, and any difference, any major difference in subsidisation on, on either side of the border is a big issue. And whether Irish farmers will be selling expensive food into a cheap, or free, or a cheap food market in, in Great Britain is, has huge consequences for us. The, apart from trade in goods, then there's the single market sec, uh, issue, which is separate from the customs union. And uh, I do agree with Sarah Carey that the distinction has to be clearly underlined. But Ireland has nothing really major to fear about the, um, the extent to which uh, um, Britain is excluded from the single market. And it is going to be excluded from the single market, quite obviously. Uh, there are ups and downs and that there are advantages, disadvantages. Some businesses will tend to move into the United Kingdom to be regulated there. Other businesses will move uh, to Dublin to, um, re uh, to, to, to be regulated here. Um, uh, I don't know what they, how, they, how they balance out, but the implications, I think, are, fair, are, fairly, are, are, are fairly predictable, um, given that Britain is getting out of the, of the, um, of the single market. Um, can I just then look forward, which is what I'm supposed to be doing, very briefly, and say that, in my view, um, if the, your EU's reaction to Britain's exit was to intensify the integration process, if that was the, the, the reaction among the Federalists in, 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 in Brussels, it will put a massive strain on this island going forward, because one part of the island will be going in one direction, and it'll be a bit like, you know, you, 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 see, you see these um, uh, documentaries about the Galapagos islands moving over uh, volcan volcanic areas under the sea. We will be going in different areas. There will be a, a San Andreas Fault type thing in terms of where the two parts of Ireland are going, unless Britain is so close to the European Union, like Norway or Switzerland or something like that, that it doesn't really matter. Um, as to what will happen in Northern Ireland? The demographics are very obvious now that the Catholic uh, section of the, of the community, insofar as yeah, that's a, a, a way of, of looking at people um, meaningfully from their political outlook is concerned, they will be in an, effect, in a gro in an effective majority uh, in the population fairly soon, and they'll be in an effective um, uh, majority in the voting population in about 20 years' time. That's the way Northern Ireland is going at the moment. And all the demographics show that that is the case. But it does not mean, in, in my view, that there's going to be a border poll, because being Catholic in Northern Ireland by no means implies that you want to switch from highly subsidized membership of the United Kingdom to a republic. And if I may say something which may surprise you, I agree with, Ger uh, with Jerry Adams, but, uh, but I'm surprised that he uh, has taken so long to realize it, that the fundamental duty for Republicans in this island, among which I count myself, is to achieve an entirely new relationship of respect uh, uh, between nationalism and republicanism on the one hand and unionism and royalism on the other hand. 
Um, that process will take a generation, probably, but it's never too soon to start the work of reconciliation of this island. Yeah, I want to go maybe to uh, Stephen, because I know you've taken particular interest in the North, and obviously a lot has moved on, and Michael has spoken to the demographics, but a lot hasn't. You know, nine out of ten, you know, social housing is still segregated along traditional political and religious lines. You look at our school system in, in Northern Ireland, where the 90% of young children um, are educated in segre uh, segregated education. It receives the largest fiscal transfer from any region um, in the UK, including ahead of Wales. So where do you see the what we next need to do there in terms of you know prioritising not just the border, but the position of, of Northern Ireland as the Brexit process moves? There goes my speech. Um, I think what has to be put front and centre is the welfare of the people of Northern Ireland. So there, there is identity politics going on, which is, which is uh, fine, but we have to recognise that Northern Ireland, before Brexit happened, Northern Ireland uh, is starting considerably further back in terms of prosperity uh, and progress than either the Republic or the UK. So the UN Human Development Index has, uh, has the Republic listed, I think, at joint eighth with Germany. The UK is at about 14th. Um, and Mark Daly worked with the Oireachtas uh, uh, research team recently to run the numbers for Northern Ireland. So the, the, the Human Development Index is an aggregate of GDP per capita, life expectancy, and education. So you can actually pull them out and run them for a region. And they're not published for a region. Um, but were they to be published for Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland ranked uh, 45th. Right, so you're in... Uh, transition economy, Eastern European levels. That's the first thing we need to we need to understand is um, because of the peace process, probably because of the 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 the, uh, the geography where it is and, and and size and so forth. It's starting from way further back, um, and Brexit is without a shadow of a doubt going to make it harder to uh, progress uh, econ uh, uh, economically in Northern Ireland. Um, and identity politics is at play. So I was at a meeting in Belfast recently with uh, ex-paramilitaries and clergy and senior business people. Uh, and most of them, or many of them, were supporting Brexit. And I said, you've thrown your, your own people under a bus here, economically. Like, what you've done is, is, is madness. And they said that for them, and some of the, a bunch of them would have been DUP supporters, they said it's not about economics, it's about identity. And if there is a decision to be made to, made to strengthen the union with the UK or strengthen the union with the Republic, we will always choose to strengthen the union with uh, Britain. Uh, and that's the way it is. So what do we do about that? First of all, we need to have an honest conversation about the fact that Northern Ireland, socio-economically, is uh, very significantly behind both the UK and Ireland. Um, and the closer integration in either way, like no, normalization with the Republic, for example, would inevitably uh, help. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing we've got to do is we've got to safeguard the Good Friday Agreement. Now, the DUP obviously aren't supporters of the Good Friday Agreement. The Tories are probably lukewarm in the Good Friday Agreement. Um, there is talk of... As an immediate step. Yeah, right. So we're in a period of let's call it uncertainty rather than instability, but we're in a period of great uncertainty and, and big things are changing. Um, the border poll is an example of trying to get an extra change in there at the same time. Um, that would be a really bad idea. The Good Friday Agreement needs to, be, needs to be protected. So when it comes to Northern Ireland, we need as much stability as we can get while Brexit is happening. Try and batten down the hatches and protect as much as we can. There is going to be damage. Minimise the border, um, minimise any potential trade links also between the North and the UK, and let's get through. But uh, let's get through Brexit, and then let's have a conversation about border poles and those kind of things in three years or five years or whenever it is. But certainly, that kind of thing shouldn't be happening right now. Um, another critical way of protecting the Northern Irish economy is to try and maintain whatever ongoing linkages we can between the North and the EU. So, uh, sector by sector. Now, special status? Special status, exactly. But special status means different things to different people. Now, interestingly, uh, Simon Coveney, in his first speech on Brexit at the launch of the committee report the other day, maybe it's because he's only three days into his brief and he doesn't know that uh, uh, Enda Kenny brought it from special status, or Charlie Flanagan from special status to uh, unique circumstances. But Simon Coveney actually was, was, was impressive in his tone. He said special status. Um, 
Special status needs to mean ongoing sector by sector leakages. Now, um, I spoke to Michel Barnier about this after he addressed the joint houses uh, a few weeks back and said, could you see uh, ongoing linkages? Small things like Erasmus, but important cultural student exchange. He said, yeah, big things like Horizon 2020, which is the full European, and he said difficult, but maybe. And so what about, what about even bigger things like the common agricultural policy? 87% of farm incomes in Northern Ireland come from Europe. Um, now, Geoffrey Donaldson, when we debated this a while ago, said that they had a guarantee that that full amount would still come from London. Well, maybe, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Well, the UK Treasury is going to be under increased pressure. Right. 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 Now, the DUP being there probably helps in terms of the short term, but certainly not in terms of the long term. So, if we could maintain whatever linkages we can, uh, because you, you, can, you can deconstruct the EU to an extent into the different sector by sector uh, agreements, fisheries, agriculture, research, student exchange now obviously it is more than some of its parts but actually you can go piece by piece and say well is there some way that we can continue to do this and we have this i think unprecedented situation where we'll have is it 1.85 million people all of whom are entitled to irish citizenship so it'll be the biggest block of irish uh, eu citizens outside of the eu now is there some way of continuing to give them access to the European Court of Justice or the, or the European Bill of Rights? I'm not saying it's easy, but that kind of detailed thinking, this is an unprecedented situation where we're saying we've nearly two million EU citizens who are shortly going to be outside the EU, outside the political institutions, the legal frameworks, the single market, the customs union. Is there anything we can do to continue to afford them legal linkages, economic linkages, cultural linkages with the rest of the EU. But the initial rhetoric uh, from across the world mm. hasn't been too um, good on institutions such as the ECJ. Neil, you, you've been charting the solutions. Do you want to share any or some of them with us? I'll share a few because the report isn't due out till Monday. And I do have a copy here, <laughs> deeply highlighted. You can give it to me later. Uh, <laughs> Michael threatened to put in about 78 amendments by close business tonight, so it's definitely not a, a final report. And one, one, um, one comment that was made, I think, by uh, Lord Alderdice was our last public speaker, and he said the difference between uh, difficult and impossible is impossible takes longer. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a real aspect where we're going to have to approach the negotiations and the discussions and trying to can say everything needs to be done by 2019 or try and envisage in 2025. While it makes for a great soundbite, it's not necessarily realistic. We do have set timelines, but ultimately whatever is going to be agreed or not agreed by the deadline is going to take a considerable amount of time to implement. However, there are a number of solutions that are readily able to go, such as a, an EU-US Open Skies Agreement. You know, that can be done quickly and it can make sure, as Michael O'Leary says, that the planes actually take off the morning after the deal is struck. Um, there's a tripartite agreement between Ireland, the UK and France in relation to the horse racing industry. All these things can be done quite easily, uh, quite quickly, and it can be front-loaded. And I think we can get those easy sort of wins, and they're good for Europe, they're good for Ireland, they're good for UK. So they're huge priorities, and we have lengthy, lengthy submissions we received to the committee of possible solutions. We only wanted solutions. Most mm -hmm. people came and they said, well, we're gonna lay out all the problems, and we had to cut across and say, you five minutes, so no. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, uh, huge, huge tranches of written submissions where they all laid out the problems, but where they identified solutions, some of them are going to be really, really difficult. Some of them are knee-jerk, some of them sound great, and they're just not realistic. But we can put in place those easy ones, like I've just mentioned. I suppose the great difficulty is the situation we find us in the short term is we don't know what the UK wants. We have a fair idea what the we UK know. doesn't know what it wants. The UK doesn't know what it wants, and ultimately when these negotiations conclude, <coughs> Do we know if we'll still be negotiating with a Theresa May-led administration or a Conservative-led administration? We don't. With the EU, we do have an element of consistency that the EU27 has agreed something that put the process in place. And even if there is a, a change in German Chancellor in September from Angela Merkel mm. to um, Martin Schulz, it's still ultimately going to be roughly the same EU27. And I think that's a positive for Ireland. Mm. And it's a positive for the process as a whole. Um, but ultimately, I'll go back to the key point. There's probably four kind of key areas that might happen in 2019. Either the UK reverse decision has another referendum and decides to abandon Brexit. Highly unlikely, but it is a possibility, and I don't think we should abandon that possibility because it's probably the best solution for Ireland. Then there's the ultimate that we have a, a clean, completed Brexit, given full assent by the European Parliament, 
great repeal bill or act passes Westminster. You know, ultimately when Brexit was voted upon just over a year ago, we would have probably thought that would happen, we're hopeful for it, but that has been completely thrown out the window now. It's, it's again, that's probably as likely as getting the UK to change their mind on Brexit at this stage. And then with the other two scenarios that are probably more likely, and actually probably one of them is definitely more scary, is that we don't get any agreement. Mm -hmm. And we go to uh, WTO rules, and that's really, really the, the worst case scenario, in my opinion, I think, bar for some ideologues in the Conservative Party, is this the worst case scenario for most. And then ultimately what I think is most likely to happen, I'll put a health warning, maybe give it a 20% or 15% chance because no one really knows, anyone who tells you they know exactly what's going to happen is either lying or delusional. But there is a fair chance that we'll have a minimal agreement that will allow for a transition period of 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a big sort of lots of grace periods being um, mooted over the weekend. Mark Carter, 2025, you wake up, is it a united Ireland? Is it what kind of an Ireland do you see? Is it a Brexit? <coughs> is it a hard Brexit? Well, um, to deal with the United Ireland issue first, I suppose, in 10 years' time, a bit longer than 2025, but I honestly believe we're going to be at the position vis-a-vis -vis United Ireland that we currently are with Brexit, by and large. In other words, we're going to know what's going to happen. It's actually going to become part of the political reality, the de facto acknowledgement of everybody who is looking at it independently. Now, whether or not the poll will have taken place or not, I'm not sure, but we will actually be in a position where we will all know that there's going to be a United Ireland. And the question that uh, I think needs to be answered is whether or not we want that to be happening in the same context that Brexit is happening now in Britain, where nobody actually knows what it's going to look like, or whether we put in the groundwork between now and then to actually map out what the political um, constitution and even some of the economic frameworks will look like in that United Ireland. That's what Sinn Féin are actually engaged with. The shorter term challenge for us all is Brexit and when I say in the next 10 years I think Brexit has accelerated that process probably by Edmonton up to another 10, 10 years so it's going to be happening a decade earlier than probably it would have naturally happened anyway. So the challenges that Brexit present um, are huge regardless of what the political circumstances in Ireland war, um, with or without partition, Brexit was always going to create challenges. It's our nearest neighbour, we have what's called a shared future, it's not a, or a shared past, it's uh, not a term I particularly like, it's a hugely important um, trading partner, um, and it stands between us and the rest of Europe. So one way or another, Brexit was always going to create huge challenges. Every one of the challenges that it presents is multiplied by the fact that we have a partitioned country. We're a very small island on the edge of Europe, little over six million people, and we have two of Everton. And we're now faced with the prospect of everything that we already have two of being um, and, and having a further wedge um, driven in between it. So there's lots of things that we need, um, need to resolve. Obviously, we all want to see an executive established in the north. I don't think that's actually going to address the fundamental problem that we have, that whenever that executive um, is re-established, the two largest parties of it are going to have exactly the opposite position on Brexit. The DUP were pro-Brexit, their supporters, um, I think this has been acknowledged uh, earlier, um, did so because for many of them it was their border poll. It wasn't about that, if that was their opportunity to say um, that um, <coughs> they're um, asserting their political loyalties as opposed to any consideration. Well, can can so I put it to you that the, the rhetoric around the border poll in the wake of the assembly elections where Sinn Féin came to within close to a thousand votes actually galvanised the DUP. I think that rhetoric backfired on Sinn Féin because it galvanised the DUP and has now led to, if you look at the political map of Northern Ireland, a more divided political map now. Do you agree that that kind of rhetoric and the fact that we haven't addressed those issues in the North around citizenship or identity politics actually backfired for you? Well, no, our vote increased from March to um, um, to the most recent Westminster elections. Also increased the DUP. It did, but if you look at what happened actually within unionism, um, un the unionist vote didn't actually increase. What happened was that the unionist vote consolidated. Um, and it consolidated, yes, it consolidated around um, the DUP. But I think if you look at, and I know there was you know, a lot of fake outrage um, in this city around Sinn Féin's abstentionism um, policy in um, relation to the election of our seven MPs. I think what happened in the North and what's happening in the North is very similar to what happened across the entire country a hundred years ago in that nationalists have said 
that they no longer consider the centre of their political lives to be in Westminster, and they are increasingly demanding that the, um, um, that the epicentre of progress happens on, in, on this island. And I know it's easy to, to describe, you know, talk of uh, border poll or poll on unity or whatever one wants to call it as rhetoric, but I think if anybody looks at what we have been doing in Sinn Féin over the past number of years, and this work began prior to Brexit, in terms of trying to outline and engage with others in relation to pursuing our ultimate objective, we're not making any apologies for that, of seeing Irish reunification, we have been going to great lengths to engage with everybody, including the unionist community. That work has been happening by and large behind the scenes, mostly at a civil, um, civic level, um, where we've been meeting with church leaders, we've been um, seeking meetings with the Orange Order, we've been meeting with um, unionist commentators, we've been hosting conferences in which we've invited every other political party to come along and give their view, the majority of which actually just simply um, but Matt, the, the, the Brexit it. deal is going to be negotiated, not yeah. even by Ireland, but the EU27 mm. um, and the UK, and there's now no voice of nationalism um, at Westminster. Michael, I might just bring you well, in on that. I, that I want to just deal with that at some point. If that's yeah, okay. Michael, is that, I think that policy of abstentionism was kind of fine when the SDLP were there, kind of flying the flag, as it were, but is, is that kind of loss of voice a concern to you at Westminster, that, that arguably if, if Sinn Féin had taken their seats, we would have almost 20 from the block of Northern Ireland rather than just 10. Well, what, what Matt has just said is correct in one sense, that the, there was a polarisation between the two, the, on, on either side of the, of the communal divide in Northern Ireland, and he says that the increase in the Sinn Féin vote was, uh, uh, is an answer to saying it backfired. But I mean, if you look at things in a slightly different way, it did backfire, and it was, it was very evident before the ele election it was backfiring, because Jerry Adams decided that he was going to talk up the border poll issue in circumstances where we all know if, if the border poll is held. Now, it'll be beaten two to one or three to one, um, uh, or at least in Northern Ireland, if there is, if there is a border poll. And this is kind of, the, the, the process of polarisation shoot, suits Sinn Féin very much. It suits them to polarise opinion, to maximise their support within the green uh, side of that, of that divide. The actual physical map of Northern Ireland in electoral terms has now pushed uh, the orange section east of the Ban and north of Armagh and uh, around Belfast. So, I mean, a polarisation is happening in Northern Ireland. And depolarisation is the fundamental issue. Uh, 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 reconciliation between the two communities in Northern Ireland is the fundamental imperative for Wolf Tone style, um, uh, Thomas Davis style Republicans. And that has not been pursued. And that is where, why we are going backwards a bit at the moment, in my view. But I don't want to get involved in a, an ideological argument. I am saying this, though, <clears throat> that the DUP is now getting one, one and a half billion as, as, as the pri uh, kind of the ransom for, for their support. And that's in the context of the Tories planning 10 years of cutbacks everywhere and progressive cutbacks which are going to cro cross the whole of, uh, of, of, of British society. Their austerity programme, which I consider to be misconceived, um, it, it, it would otherwise have bitten much more heavily into Northern Ireland and would have created a crisis there because uh, Sinn Féin and the DUP, neither of them can really live with, with austerity digging in deeper into that society. And uh, then finally, to, to come to the point about being optimistic, because I don't want to be argumentative here, I, I do believe in a united Ireland, and I do believe in reconciliation. But, I, I, but if the response of the European Union is to impose an increasingly integrated and um, different order on the member states, the, I go back to the point I made earlier, the tectonic plates will be moving in different directions. And the reason I brought the book along, it's a book about the Habsburg Empire. I believe, I believe absolutely that any attempt to impose uh, uh, an integrated federalist European um, um, uh, plan for Europe in this context now will lead to disintegration rather than integration. I don't believe, uh, I don't believe that a top-down thing such as is favoured by Guy Verhofstadt is right at all. I think what's needed in Europe is a big pause so that all of Eastern Europe and the Balkans and all the rest of it can come together and see what's wrong with Europe at the moment. It is fundamentally intergovernmental and that in my view is the way it, it must remain because there isn't a common European people. A Bulgarian and an Irish person cannot even talk to each other in the same language. We cannot understand 
uh, the same jokes. We can't watch a uh, president of Europe's presidential debate on TV without wondering what the hell is going on. Uh, so, I mean, let's be realistic. Let's keep Europe in touch with the people and yeah. let's keep it at a government well, level. Well, that segues kind of nicely into the next um, question for the panel, which is, you know, what is going to be the future of Europe and Ireland's relationship with it? Because some have uh, perceived the rise of, of Macron as kind of an, uh, a reason for a closer uh, European integration, especially where now um, it's kind of been around and about for quite a while, but certainly the discussion around the, the potential for a Eurozone Treasury and the Eurozone Finance Minister is certainly gaining much, much more um, traction now. But it comes with caution for smaller member states. I think it was uh, Michael Noonan possibly at one of these events who um, urged caution um, about uh, how Europe could become a cold place for smaller countries arrest essentially around red line issues such as tax and in particular I think the context he made in speaking in a stand to be corrected was the CCC TV. So um, is this an opportunity for those in Europe who want to push ahead and actually is that something that could that, that, that could backfire and where Stephen do we fit in within that debate? We're going to have to box really, really clever for the next few years because several things have happened and they're probably all negative or neutral for Ireland in terms of our position in Europe. We've all seen, first of all, just going back to when we joined the Monetary Union, we saw what being out of sync with the mainland did at a time when the price of money needed to go up for us, the price of money went close to zero which led to this huge influx of cash into the into the country and we all know what happened after that so we already have some reasonable experience of being out of sync with the main powers from a, for, in, in, in a monetary union um, we now have another problem because the uk one of the things that hasn't been said enough on brexit at all um, is that europe the european project is now much much poorer without britain in it without the uk in it um, for us in particular, but the union as a, the, there was a great uh, YouTube video of Patrick Stewart doing a takeoff of the uh, Monty Python, what have the Romans ever done for us? And they were making the point that actually the European Bill of Rights originally came from, from the UK and they've, they've been huge contributors. And actually I think you need a big, powerful, Eurosceptic country yeah. in there because they, because the European project has is, is, has been phenomenally successful in certain ways in what it was set up to do, which was to stop uh, Europeans sticking pitchforks in each other, and it's worked incredibly, incredibly well, and it's worked well economically, notwithstanding, you know, banking and monetary stuff in recent years. Um, part of that is due to the UK. Now, from Ireland's perspective, there's only two civil law countries in, or sorry, common law countries, uh, us and the, and, and the UK. They're gone or going, so that causes a huge problem for us at a, at a bureaucratic level. So for example, the European directives get written in civil law. There's then an army of very clever British bureaucrats who do all the due diligence and translation into common law and my understanding is that our civil servants then essentially do the due diligence yeah. on their work and we transpose it in and it comes before a committee and committees kind of nod at the, and the, the EU directives go in. We now have a massive skills deficit in terms of taking civil law and bringing it into common law. Um, but we're also... At a time when there's a huge push for harmonisation. Yeah, right? Yeah. There is also a, 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 a big problem for us in that we have lost our... Um, closest ally and our only big ally and my understanding is that Britain and Ireland have voted almost identically for decades within Europe. Um, one of the things that the UK has largely protected us on as you say is corporation tax. It may be a coincidence but it would be an extraordinary coincidence. Within 24 hours of the Brexit vote last year the European Commission relaunched the CCCTV. I would be astounded if there is no link between those two things. Now, whenever you talk to uh, diplomats from other member states or politicians from other member states, uh, they say, of course we recognise Ireland's problems, of course we recognise the unique issue with Northern Ireland, we're very sympathetic and we, will, we, we are going to help you. And then they pause and they say, we want to talk to you about your corporation tax though. So we need to be very clear that the, the various things that we are asking of our, our um, other 26 member states, there is a quid pro quo. So all of this special status of Northern Ireland, or we'll do this for Ireland, or you know, 
we will maintain the common travel area for Ireland. That's not free. There is, there is diplomatic capital and political capital being used up. So our corporation tax uh, is far more at risk than it was. And of course, the way you get it is not to try and, try and change the treaty, because the 12.5% is protected by, by treaty. It's the CCCTB, and you just undermine it, and that will wipe billions off our tax base, because we'd end up with somewhere between, I guess, a third and a half of it here, with a huge amount of it going out to the big countries where they actually buy the stuff. Um, so, that, so, so that is a big problem. And I, I, I agree with Michael, I, I'll finish on this. There was the, the, the European project went too fast for too many people. Um, Bertie Ahern, when he was giving his speech in the US to the joint houses, he gave a second speech to the Harvard uh, Kennedy School, um, and we, he was talking about Europe. And at it, I asked him from the, from, from the floor, I was a student, I said to him, the European Constitution, the EU Constitution, it got put forward and it got voted down. It looked like it was going to get voted down in other areas. And his response was more or less, now I'm paraphrasing, we saw that and we pretty much changed the title of it. So it didn't require any more votes. Now, if the European project thinks that it is okay to treat European citizens like that, something bad has happened. Um, I think there is going to be a push for further integration. I think Macron will be big on this. Guy Verhofstadt obviously is big on this. And without the UK, we have to have a very serious conversation in Ireland about how we manoeuvre this, because we, we forget sometimes how small we are in this whole thing. So, I and mean, that's a point. If you look at Eurobarometer surveys, Ireland, which you know sometimes it takes a wee bit of a nudge to, to agree to various referenda, um, but it has consistently high support. Um, in the main for the European project, could that change if some, if in the Brexit process, some of the red lines for Ireland and now very much a small country without one of its uh, biggest uh, closest brothers in the Union, do you think that that could change and how much of a risk is that as the Brexit process unfolds? There's, there's a few things I think. The key thing when it comes to Ireland's relationship with the European project is we have to be very, very careful when ministers from all parties and none and MEPs go to Brussels or Strasbourg, we are very good at painting ourselves as good Europeans who desire to be at the heart of Europe. And that's, that's worthwhile. And being part of the European project has, has allowed us to come out of the UK shadow. Um, but then when we come back home to Dublin, we're very, very quick to knock the EU and blame, oh, we can't do that because Brussels is doing this. Or, you know, and our, and our referendum are the exact examples of that. Oh, no, we can't be voting for the Fiscal Stability Treaty to lead to abortion and demand. Absolutely no relevance in the question at stake. But those are the sort of arguments that are put. And we, as a political, political collective and a media collective, don't question that enough. We don't question the easy excuse, and I'm putting this challenge down to my own ministers and my own party, mm -hmm. that when they're making a slight against Brussels or trying to excuse their own shortcomings because something will happen on a European level, that comes with a massive, massive cost. And that cost we see in the UK now, years upon years of doing down the EU to the extent that it looked like a sketch, led to Brexit by a very, very, very narrow majority fueled on a campaign based on lies but the campaign. But now we are at that point. So therefore, when we're talking about our engagements with Europe, we can't say, or at a European level, we can't always say that we're under threat, we're being attacked. They're pushing for integration against our will. We're all isolated. And people who said, well, now Brexit's the time we stick up for ourselves and threaten to leave. It's the most you know, ridiculous proposition we can make. We'll threaten to leave Europe if we don't get our way and absolutely everything. As Stephen said, we need to negotiate carefully. We need to get in there. And we, we do it very well. And I think the last 12 months is, uh, at a political and diplomatic level has showed that Ireland can play the European game exceptionally well when it wants to on that European level. Domestically, I think we're wanting. So therefore, when we are looking at the, the threats and they are coming, people will want further integration and people hold Macron up as the person who's going to push further integration. Nearly as many Euro, he got nearly as many Eurosceptics voted in the first round of the presidential elections either for uh, Macron and Le Pen. So you know, he's not exactly on a hundred percent he he got a strong mandate in the second round himself and he's an even better on an assembly level. But I don't think there's necessarily going to be this push towards full United States Europe way too soon. Never going to happen. But I do it depends on who you're listening to. You know, it, it depends, especially in areas around defence and justice and home affairs. I mean, if, yeah, you, know, if, if, if you look outside the Irish and UK press, there, there are a lot of people who see Brexit as an opportunity uh, to, move, to, to move that uh, project 
forward and certainly any time I... Almost all of the European leaders, mm -hmm. it was, it, and it was one of the criticisms I've had of the e EU um, immediately after Brexit. Um, it was seen as an opportunity by some, including John claude Juncker, to put it at the very first press statement. The EU army was, was mentioned, uh, consolidated cooperation tax uh, was mentioned, um, and there is a, a nap and it's one of the things I find most striking um, within the European institutions, including some MEPs. The actual, it's not just something that we we talk about the democratic uh, deficit, but there is a real disconnect. You know, I I just found it bizarre that so many people very intelligent people who've been around politics for a long time were celebrating the fact, the good news, that only, only 35% of French people voted for a fascist. You know, in, but that's not really something to be celebrated, um, in my view. That's something that should be sending a very stark message to EU leaders that there are still a lot of problems and a lot of disconnect between the people that are supposed to be served by the EU and those. From our point of view, I do think um, and I get what Neil has said, and it's something that I have um, challenged your ministers saying it's that shower over in, in Europe for decisions that maybe not them, but their predecessors actually signed off in a, clo in a closed room. But I do think sometimes we need to get beyond just our own sound bites of we need to box clever, and sometimes we need to actually say out loud what our red lines are, because sometimes we, we have as an a, as a official government position these nuanced positions, and we're expecting the EU to understand that what we mean by that is that we're not really happy with this, but we're almost afraid to upset anybody. I think while we've rightly um, commended those people who have put Ireland into the, into the frame in terms of its, you know, the, third okay. point, the third point that's mentioned, but remember, the first meeting after, after the actual Brexit vote, the first council meeting of the EU 27, Enda Kenny went in and championed Scotland. He didn't actually mention Ireland. He was the modern day Braveheart going in on behalf of Nicola Sorgen and, um, and, uh, and the Scottish people, rather than actually pointing out even at that early stage that the north of Ireland has every single argument that the Scottish have, except that you know, two additional arguments, one that it's part of a country that was um, divided and is in the process of a very complicated conflict resolution process, and secondly, the point that I think Stephen made earlier on, that every citizen in the north is entitled to Irish and therefore are de facto EU um, citizens. Um, and it was only with the, the kickback at home here, both politically and within the media, that the government started to realise that you know, a week into it they still hadn't got the central premise. And I think there was, and there has been, a guard against upsetting or insulting those people who are, whether they be the British government or the DUP, for that matter, who were on, in this case, the exact opposite side of us. So we need to be upfront with them and say, you're on the opposite side of Irish national interest. And in this case, we're going to have to be, uh, we're going to have to be articulating a different position. Michael, I'm going to let you come in there and then we're going to open it to the floor yeah. about Durable. 10 or 12 minutes Durable, just for to, questions. Just to say one thing, I, I agree completely with Neil. If you look at the original round of voting on French elections, Fillon was not a, a strong federalist at all. He was middle of the road for European, more in tune with my own views. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the far left guy, I forgot what his name now, uh, Mélenchon, he, he, was, he, he, was, he was positively anti-European um, and uh, uh, her ladyship was po positively anti-European. So I mean, in fact of the four front runners who accounted for 80% plus of the votes, only one of them was uh, adopting Macron's point of view, but the French system actually magnifies the winner to an incredible mm -hmm. position such as we have. And if you look around Europe, I mean, the, uh, the fact that Donald Trump was uh, taking his, his crowbar to Europe and trying to break it up uh, a, few, a few months ago uh, is now over. That crisis is over. The, the, um, the Dutch elections, the Austrian elections, uh, and what's going to happen in Germany in my view, mean, means that all of that, that, that kind of external threat is over. But the mere fact that normality is coming back to Europe should not be interpreted by the Federalists as uh, because you're rejecting Trump and because you're rejecting Mélenchon and you're rejecting Le Pen, that you are saying, please give us more Europe no matter what. One final point. When the Irish Times last measured Irish views on European attitudes, it was in the context of David Cameron going to, England, to, to Europe looking for three or four concessions. And the interesting thing is that on all the points on which he was seeking concessions, whether he was right or wrong, the Irish people supported him three to one 
or two, or two and a half to one on all of the issues that he was concerned about. No, 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 no um, um, uh, 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 unlimited integration and all the rest of it. The Irish people, and I think most people in Europe, are not on the same wavelength as the small minority in, in Brussels who are pushing the thing too fast. And Europe isn't like a bicycle. It isn't something that, if it's not going forward, it falls flat. I mean, we should have more confidence in Europe. You know, it does, it, the, the Federalist agenda is not the only agenda for Europe. There are plenty of other agendas for Europe. And this is why this institution and the Irish media generally should get rid of the Eurosceptic versus uh, uh, Eurofederalist punch and duty show and should concentrate on the middle ground of Irish politics where most people are located. Okay. Well, shouldn't be enough, certainly. So, so I'm going to throw it open to the floor. Sarah Carey, there we go. Sorry, sticking my word again. Two points. One, oh, sorry. One to Matt. I agree very much with Michael's analysis of the North and the polarisation and how it does suit Sinn Féin to have that. And yes, you were right. The unionists voted Brexit because that was an identity issue for them. At some point, though, the penny is going to have to drop with them that the money is going to be a factor and there won't be this endless uh, flow of money from Westminster. By constantly talking about the border poll and by bedding down on those identity issues, are you not making it harder for them to change their mind when the point comes where they inevitably must change their mind? And that there is a responsibility, I don't know if Conor McEvitt is still here, he can speak to anyone about how the centre did not hold in the north, that now that you've won your end of the argument as such, you have to bring your people into the centre so you can make it easier for the DUP to do that U-turn when they need to make it. For Michael, I agree with a huge amount of what you said, especially about that gap between you know, the leaders of Europe and the people. But with regard to halting the project, Surely one of the great solutions, and I would follow the work of people like Kevin O'Rourke on this, is that the monetary union must be finished. That the reason we hate, you know, the EU is because they left us... The project. I'm not no. the right, but, but actually completing it is a legitimate solution to a lot of the problems that we wouldn't have been so left holding the can. Complete is the difference. Well, say the monetary and banking union, that the next time... No problem with the banking union. Right. Or here's another one, you mentioned defence. Um, uh, and of course, big problem with that. okay, we well, let me put a, a, a scenario to you and I'll, I'll wrap it up then. So when we hear defense, we go, oh, a European army. All right. But there are two sides of it. Number one, Russian aggression on the um, uh, Western or sorry, the Eastern border. Latvia are facing the very real prospect, you know, of an incursion. And are we going to stand by That's and say absolutely Russia. nothing? Mm -hmm. Secondly, on defence contracts, we're always hearing about how we have problems getting um, air cover and coast guard cover. And if we were able to do a common defence contract and buy helicopters and airplanes cheaper, that would be a benefit to us. So in one way, are you not falling into the same trap that Neil mentioned, where we blame the EU for certain things, or maybe they could actually be providing a solution? Okay, so Michael answers to pass the mic back to... Um, well, I, I, don't, I don't agree that we... Uh, first of all, the people alter the constitution to say we will not participate in the European defence. It isn't simply an option, as some people have written. It's, it's a pr positive prohibition. We're, we're, we're out. And they're not going to change their mind about going in. And if we want ch cheap Coast Guard helicopters and fishery protection vessels and all the rest of it, I have no problem with that. But uh, the protection of Latvia is, in my view, best, t best undertaken by NATO and not by, um, by uh, some new thing somewhere in Brussels. Uh, other than nations. Can I just respond, just in terms of you know, whether or not we should be talking about a border poll or either. A United Ireland is the reason I got involved in politics. It's the reason why I developed an interest in it. I firmly believe the partition is the biggest stumbling block to us as a nation reaching our full potential. I believe it's the cause and root of lots of problems that we face and it's the best solution for us to provide us with the means to get over um, some of those problems. So I actually find that um, frankly um, insulting when people say to me you should keep your mouth shut about the issue that you care most uh, uh, about. What I, ha what I do agree is that we have a responsibility and I, I said this quite clearly. I, I, I mentioned we had a, a big large conference in Belfast at the weekend which unionists were in attendance and which other um, uh, independent commentators and we were talking about these whole issues and I said and I believe firmly I don't ever expect to get the, that the people who vote for Gregory Campbell to ever vote yes in a poll on Irish unity. 
But what I do expect, and what I expect of me and others who support the United Ireland, is to convince them that they may not like the out final outcome, but they have nothing to fear in terms of their own identity, their own culture, and their own position within society. So that's the work that we're doing, because we're laying the groundwork, in my view, and we want others to join with us in doing so, in setting out the parameters of what a new Ireland will look like. So at the very minimum, when we do ask people to vote, they know what they're voting for. And yet consent is at the heart of everything Absolutely. in the Good Friday Agreement. Would you like to ask yeah, a question I just, uh, before I pass over to Partly in the same vein as Sarah, I wonder about the consensus on the panel that European integration is something to be, sorry, further European integration is something to be warded off and feared and something that the Irish public definitely don't want. The last opinion poll I saw on the subject, which was done late last year, suggested that most Irish people do want European further integration. Sorry, further European integration. And like, if you can boil it down to a practical level, if you wanted to sell that idea to people, the benefits of it, you know, if Irish people really felt that they could ring up a motor insurer in Germany or Italy and get car insurance from them, or if I knew that my son could apply for a job in France or Germany and his Irish qualifications would be automatically recognized as just as good, or if we knew for a fact that Irish bond yields will never go through the roof again because they'll be European bonds. There is a big argument to be made for the benefits of further European integration, the completion of the single market, and I just say we shouldn't automatically assume that Irish people don't want that and are close to that argument. I think it speaks to probably what uh, Stephen and Neil were speaking about earlier. It's probably a, it's a sectoral by sectoral thing. There may be areas that they're very happy about, but red lines are not. Before I go to Eamon, I'm going to... I wanted, I wanted to ask Stephen, Stephen, the point you made about there ain't been nothing for nothing in terms of the, the, the trade-off and tax, uh, I think is very sort of pertinent and relevant. So I'm wondering how and when might or could that be nailed? I don't. Given how complex the whole thing is and nobody has any idea. I mean, it's a very realistic scenario, but how might it come about? I don't, I don't know how it might come about. It's, it's, a, it's diplomatic ebb and flow, and it's political capital, and it's you know, side meetings at a European conference or, or, or whatever it is. So my sense is I haven't, I haven't been in office, I haven't taken part in formal European negotiations, so, so I'd have to say I don't know. Someone like Michael would have, a, would have a better idea of exactly how it comes about. From the position I'm in, it's a general raising of awareness of it. It's a general sense of A, the stuff you want ain't coming for free. There is a there is a quid pro quo for all of this stuff. And pretty much the only topic that ever comes up in terms of the quid pro quo is tax. And it comes up regularly. And politicians, diplomats, officials, right across the board, there's always just a little pause after the we're gonna help you out and then you gotta talk about your tax though. You know? Now I think in fairness, the previous government has helped that a lot. I got into a, a debate with a Reuters, Brussels-based um, journalist on this the other day, and he was still kind of making, asserting that, well, it's still very, you know, it's very fast and loose in Ireland, and I'm saying, well, well actually it's not. You know, the, 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 the double Irish loophole has been shut down. We're at the forefront of the, the, uh, the OECD, the BEPS process. So I think in fairness to the previous government, they actually did put several things in place that gave us a little bit of pushback. Um, but I do think without, there's two, we have two problems. One is we are asking for stuff of the, of the EU, 20, of our 26 colleagues, mm -hmm. and you know, there is a, there is a, a, a balance sheet. Um, and secondly, we have just lost our greatest political ally and a very large political ally in there. Uh, it's interesting to think after the Apple ruling there was a lot of debate as to whether the, you know, vestiger was it uh, kind of using the Trojan horse of tax avoidance to actually uh, herald in um, greater tax harmonisation. It's interesting to see that there's many different ways to skin uh, a corporate uh, tax cut. Um, Eamon, I'll give you the final question before we wrap up. Uh, echo David's point um, I, I challenge a lot of Michael's uh, uh, suppositions about the situation. It's like as if you're slightly fighting last year's war uh, and indeed the Brexit war because you, you, you don't want punch and Judy but you use the phrase Euro-Federalists. I mean for anyone who supports integration and I, I, I disagree absolutely that the bicycle can just stand still. 
If anything, Brexit has shown us that the EU can't just complacently go along and allow this kind of toxic internal debate. It, I think people would support in Ireland uh, further integration, uh, obviously in an accountable and transparent level. But for, for other reasons that haven't been mentioned, which is the global situation, the threat from China, the obvious military threat from Russia, you say NATO can take care of that in terms of Latvia, but it's more than just a military border a regional thing, it's a global issue. And you, you mentioned that Trump and that, that threat has passed his, his disengagement. Or, but if you look at all the people who have voted for Trump, they would continue to have that isolationist, anti European, anti EU sense of withdrawal. So I, I, I'm a little bit, I used to be very Eurosceptic, but now suddenly with the British gone, I'm kind of with the Germans and the French and those Europeans who want the project to work in saying we have to build a space. And I think a lot of Irish people are more supportive of that than they used to be. Well, just briefly, I'm pro-Europe. I voted in, yes in every European referendum, but I do not want a, a single European superstate. Now, you, you say that to use the word federalist, uh, that I'm being sort of slightly pejorative in using the term. There is a federalist movement in Europe. It's all around you. Take a look at it. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not an invention of mine. It's not a label that I chose for them. It's the label they choose for themselves. Read Guy Verhofstadt's book on, the, on, on uh, Europe, uh, why Europe or Europe now or whatever it is. He actually uh, is asserting that Europe must become an empire. And he uses the phrase, a good empire. Right? And I don't want to be part of a European empire dominated by Germany. I think we've had that argument, and our France and Germany in combination. Well, what do you want? I, want? I want Europe to be, uh, first of all, I want it to consolidate itself. I, want, I mean, we have big problems with the Baltic, uh, Serbia and all these places applying for membership. We have to say no, finally, to, 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 to Turkey for 50 years because uh, they've, they've gone in a different direction now. But given that we have this huge big area, it does not have to pretend to be the United States of Europe. It does not have to uh, create um, a kind of a centralized power. Because if you create a centralized army, if you create a centralized prosecutor, if you create centralized court systems and all the rest of it, which go with federalism, you have to have a democratic government. And a democratic government requires a demos who actually share uh, not merely um, uh, legal values at a constitutional level, but who actually feel a loyalty, who feel, who feel uh, that they have something in common. The United States had that. The uh, Europe, and that's why I brought the book on Habsburg, it didn't have it, and it collapsed. And any attempt to create the power structures without the genuine popular support will create something far, far worse. We'll give the final words out. to Neil Lett. Yeah, I suppose um, Michael's very right to say that Federalists surround him as a member of the Young European Federalist myself. <laughs> <laughs> Arrest that man. <laughs> <laughs> um, surround him every day in the chamber and you know as Matt said a united Ireland is why he got involved in politics further the, the power and the dream of Europe is as corny as it sounds is why I got involved in politics as someone who kind of looked at Ireland where you have Fianna Fáil, where you have Celtic, where you have Rangers, all this stuff you had to look to Europe for something progressive and new and came and you don't get excited looking at the Burley Man or the buildings in Brussels or directives and lawyer linguists pouring things over into common law to get that but you can still say you're a federalist, and at the same time, to come back to David's original point and say that, yeah, we don't need to go on full integration just yet. Your, the European dream has only been going 60 years. I want it to last 60 more and 60 more after that. It's not a rush to get everything done in the next six months or the next six years. And there's no point saying that maybe one day some of us do aspire to the United States of Europe. Probably not in my lifetime. But we can have to, we have to consolidate Europe. We have to start selling Europe. Europe has to start selling itself. But we also have to have the responsibility that if we are going to be pro-European, that we don't run to knock everything and find the 1% problem with something that's 99% good. Otherwise, there's going to be no Europe to fight for in 10 years, let alone 60. There we go. So we promised you a, a kind of I have a dream uh, session. And um, <laughs> we're going to wrap it up now. Um, uh, on your behalf, I would like to thank Neil, Stephen, Michael, and particularly Tomato Stood in Berlin. And